So I'll be looking at the replies by Schmidt, Kelsen and Heller to the July crisis. Schmidt and Heller actually served. They were at the court. Mm -hmm. Schmidt was uh, representing, together with other lawyers, the Reich, and uh, Heller was representing, <coughs> together with others, Prussia. Ke Kelsen was not, but he published very soon afterwards uh, a lengthy essay, and also before he had published on related issues. I will be um, devoting uh, more attention to Schmidt's position, and then a bit ex negativo to Kelsen and Heller. So I start with Carl Schmidt, whose position could be described as an existentialist, decisionist, nationalist view of politics and sovereignty. In his book, Legality and Legitimacy from 1932, he writes that a parliamentary democracy is committed to the principle of equal chance, namely that those in power need to keep path open to power for their opponents. But, Schmidt argues, this is suicidal when the opponent wants to destroy parliamentary democracy. Some Prussian officials took over this argument, then saying, well, Schmidt is actually telling us that we were correct to want to ban the SA, the, the Nazi troops, and also to protest against the emergency decree. However, I would like to point out now four points within Schmidt's position, showing that he actually was not at all in favor of uh, upholding uh, the independence of Prussia and liberalism in general. So these four points are, first, Schmidt sides with von Papen. Second, Schmidt rejects parliamentary democracy and embraces autocracy. autocracy. Third, Schmidt endorses nationalism. And fourth, Schmidt undermines the role of the constitutional court in the proceedings. Okay, so Schmidt sides with Papen. He argues that the role of the social democrats in Prussia was a threat to which the Reich had responded, was the actual threat to which the Reich had responded with the emergency decree. And it's not true that what, uh, what the emergency decree responded to, to was the possible breakdown of safety and order. So all Schmidt is doing here in his own just justification in court you know, on behalf of the Reich. He's simply repeating von Papen's radio declaration, and I think he's contradicting the wording of Hindenburg's own decree, which was not mentioning the Social Democrats at all, but indeed was saying it aims at re-establishing safety and order. So this is a simple factual point against Schmidt here. Second point, Schmidt rejects the parliamentary democracy um, of, of Prussia and the Reich and embraces autocracy. This is my most substantial point. It can be subdivided into three definitional conditions concerning sovereignty. So three conditions uh, for his definition of sovereignty. I will go uh, through them one by one. Schmidt argued that Prussia was not okay to ban the Nazi troops, um, for in order to be able to do that, you need to have an independent sovereign who will decide whether or not a party is in a certain conflict is an illegal one, it's whether it's an enemy of the state or of the constitution. And of course, the Prussian government, being led by a party, the Social Democrats, was not independent, and hence it was not the guardian of the constitution. Rather, the court case um, at the constitutional court was really a case between the state and the party political faction, so pol party political politics. That's how he reconstructs the whole situation as one between the Reich on the one hand and parliamentarism, party politics, on the other hand. So Schmidt then goes on to argue that by contrast, von Papen's government had full legitimacy because it was entirely independent of parliamentary party politics. His mandate, after all, was given by the president, who was the true guardian of the constitution, I think a possible reply to this is that that's a sophism, 
for you could say that von Papen was not at all independent of party politics. He had plotted with Hindenburg and was, uh, well, almost sharing the same bed with, with Hitler. So he, and Hindenburg himself was not, not independent either. So this raises the question of how are we to judge and who is to judge um, independence at all. In general, Schmidt argued, liberalism is to be seen as the threat to state sovereignty because of its in inherent, inherent struggle between parties, which is a struggle between fragmented interest groups, and those interest groups eventually will poison Germany. A government, I'm quoting here from Dysonhaus summarizing Schmidt's position, a government that enjoys a parliamentary mandate is part of the problem, since such a government is under the control of one or more political parties. So this leads us to the first condition of sovereignty. A quote from the political theology from 1922. In fact, I think it's the first sentence. The sovereign is he who decides on the state of exception. Uh, there is an ambiguity in this uh, sentence, which I'll be discussing later. And according to Schmidt, this is the president. The uh, Hindenburg or Ebert, whoever that is, doesn't matter. Now, this, this, this first condition on the sovereignty, however, is only a necessary condition. You need more in order to decide who is actually the sovereign. So that leads us to the second condition of sovereignty. He who makes, by existential decision, the friend-enemy distinction is the sovereign. So the second condition is based on the friend-enemy distinction. This was formulated, for instance, in the concept of the political. This distinction is necessary for politics because it's what gives life, intensity, authenticity to all political action. And only such political action is true, is genuine political action, because it's struggle. Really, only struggle is political action at the end of the day. You must have an enemy. The enemy must be public, and it must be existentially different. It's not about just disagreeing about insurance policies or things like that. It's, you have to be existentially different from me. You have to be the stranger in some sense. And because you are existentially different from me as my enemy, Conflicts with you can't be regulated via rules and norms a priori in advance. That's, that's, that's not on. Here is a quote from Political Theology. The normal proves nothing. The exception proves everything. The rule lives of the exception. In virtue of the exception, the force of actual life breaks through the crust of a mechanics grown listless by repetition. Okay, unquote. Here you are. We discussed the problem of mechanics. Anayana brought that up. Liberalism, when it comes to this problem, can't draw the friend-enemy distinction without contradiction. Why? Because according to liberalism, the opponent is granted equal rights to power, and that, according to Schmidt, is self-deceiving and suicidal. Why? Because liberalism, of course, does have enemies, deadly enemies. And therefore, in order to, in, instead of accepting liberalism, Schmidt argues that we have to accept some other sort of political agency or ideology which does make the explicit friend-enemy distinction. Namely, it must be an ideology which aims at the eradication of the, of the enemy, especially the internal enemy of the state, so that the state can be then become internally homo homogeneous, homogeneous, sorry, homogeneous. And then, of course, uh, the grand vision by Schmidt is that once the state has become homogeneous, then you can go to war against other states, and it will be all a wonderful war world. <clears throat> now, one note I would like to make here, a personal comment, it's unclear to me why actually liberalism can't make the friend-enemy distinction, for you could say, if you follow, for instance, today's uh, constitution of Germany, the friends are the friends of the constitution, the 
those who adopt the and abide by the constitution and the enemies are the enemies of the constitution in um, today's german constitution which is a constitution based on values on inviolable values it's a liberal democratic order we don't have just a changeable positive law so the individual constitutional statutes as far as i understand are not all simply changeable they're not positive law which can be which can be uh, modified rather we have fundamental values which can't be changed and if you subscribe to these values then you are a friend of the constitution if you are not you are an enemy of the constitution mm -hmm. and that's why we have a verfassungsschutz yeah a defense of the of the constitution and you can get into deep trouble if you have a political association which denies this basic uh, values. By the way, the five basic values uh, of, of today's Germany are federalism, sorry, are democracy, rule of law, social welfare state, republicanism, and federalism. So if you go against these five things, which to me are very substantial values, right, then you're becoming an enemy of the state. So I don't quite see why, uh, why one can't, why a liberal of this sort, not a Kelsen type liberal who may be uh, was a um, value, a value relativist, but uh, an absolute uh, understanding of political values. Why, why they can't make such a distinction? Why, why, why this distinction is not perfectly uh, legitimate? So, in other words, why, why is it really necessary that liberalism is self-contradicting? Following Schmidt, I'm, I don't quite understand this. Sorry, you had a question. Yes. Are they kind of put down yes. some uh, verdicts of past uh, yeah, so constitutional... Uh, yeah, so we have the, the, yeah, you have this eternity clause which encompasses Article 1, the dignity of man, and Article 20, which are democracy, rule of law, social welfare state, republic, republicanism, and federalism. And those things can't be changed. So unlike in the Weimar Republic, you can't do anything against them. Because Not the even with super majority, you can't do it. you can't change them. Hmm? But the rest is so when you refer to these core values that make the enemy friend distinction, they could be the eternity Yes, right? yes. But of course, from there you can derive lots of other values, right? But is there something like, because in Hungary now there is this ongoing debate whether the interpretation of the constitutional mm. court is bound to the past body of constitutional court mm. rulings? Is there such a thing like so that the history of constitutional interpretations provide some constraint in or provide some I'm not I'm not an expert on this all I understand is that the current German constitution was ba drafted with the flaws of the Weimar constitution in mind so they learned after a great disaster from it it took a lot to, to learn from it but uh, you have to ask uh, maybe other people in the room will know about this once we get to the to the Hungarian problem. Okay, then the third problem, Schmidt endorses nationalism, <clears throat> which leads us to the third condition of sovereignty. The sovereign is the folk, is the German folk. Why is that so? He actually argued in the court in Leipzig that the equation between the Nazis and the communists, as put forward by Prussia, uh, was insulting to the Nazis. For the Reich's decision to lift the ban against the Nazis was entirely objective and rightful, according to, to Schmidt. Why was it rightful to stop banning the Nazis? Because the, Nazis move, the Nazi movement reflected the support of millions of Germans. Uh, a footnote to that is, so the member numbers uh, of the Nazi party in 1932 was 1 1.2 million million okay not millions but still 1.2 million but still the deutsch uh, the german communist party had 330,000 so one third so uh, you can wait in any case so by he seems to be implying with this argument that we need to give some sort of content to the homogeneity of the second condition and this uh, this sort of content is the german people itself the folk they come into political existence not through secret ballots, because secret, secret ballots is what divides us, <laughs> right? Okay. Not what unites us, what makes us one thing. And 
what is it that unites us? It's the open acclamation in, in the square, I don't know, in the center of, 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 of Germany. Um, so it's, the, it's saying the ja to the, to the leader who is chosen and who then expresses the unified will of the people. In fact, he argues that acclamation is constitution. He's playing here on the ambiguity of constitution understood as we meet together, yeah, we, the constitution of meeting together and the constitution as in, the, in the legal political sense. And um, in choosing the ruler, uh, a ruler with whom then the people identify themselves, we are establishing the ruler-ruled identity because the ruler is given unconditional trust like a mortal god. So that may refer back to Le Leviathan. I'm not sure about that. So this one, existential choice, is what is the fundamental constitution according to Schmidt and the, uh, all norms and constitutional statutes and therefore all laws own their entire validity to this one ultimate decision which is the act or the fact of constitution making. Okay, so I quote here from the Verfassungslehre, the theory of constitution from 1928. Dictatorship is possible only on democratic grounds while it altogether contradicts the principles of the liberal Rechtsstaat. That is because it is not characteristic of the dictator that he is given a competence that is appropriate circumscribed, that is controlled by norms. On the contrary, the scope and content of his empowerment turn on his discretion so that, above all, there is no issue of jurisdiction in the sense given by the Reichsstaat. So the very clearly here, rejection of, of any kind of legal impediments, uh, statutory impediments uh, onto the onto the ruler and onto the, the folk in last instance. All right, so this brings us then to uh, his position on the relation between legitimacy and legality, or rather the legitimacy of legality, of law itself. Schmidt undermining the role of the constitutional court. He argued in Leipzig at the court that the judicial review, review itself at the court was illeg illegitimate. Now, I'm, I'm not an expert on this, but this sounds to me like a blatant contradiction, how he, in the court, can say that the entire proceedings of the court are not valid, right? It's almost like a skeptical paradox in, in epistemology. But constitutional lawyers do every day in constitutional All right, I see. Okay, good, okay. Good. Well, I'm a philosopher. I go by contradiction. So to me, this sounds like a contradiction. All right. Um, First, the Prussian government had been replaced by the Reichskommissar, so it had no, no standing in the court. So the Prussian government had no right really to be there because it had been displaced. Secondly, the court deals with legal issues and is, is indeed the guardian of the constitution, however, only in legal matters, whereas here we are dealing with political issues and the president is therefore the guardian of the constitution in political matters, which is expressed by Article 48. Sovereign is he who decides on the state of exception. However, I would like to point out that, and Dysonhaus actually points out here an ambiguity of this sentence, sovereign is he who decides on the state of exception. It could be either understood whoever actually or factually decides on the exception will be the sovereign, yeah, that's entirely descriptive, whereas uh, on the, or decisionist, whereas on the second reading is whoever has the right mm -hmm. is entitled to decide on the exception, uh, uh, sorry, whoever has the right uh, to decide on the exception is the sovereign, right? So that, that's a slightly different reading of this problem. If we read it in a purely uh, descriptivist or decisionist way, then it seems that genuine political power cannot be constrained by any legal statute. That's what uh, Dysonhaus analyzes. And this seems then to be in accordance with Schmidt's own argument before the court, for he argued that we have a primacy of the political over the legal, a side note here, I don't quite understand how this exactly squares with Schmidt's own view that all law is supposed to be political. Maybe I'm just confused here. If we have a primacy of the political over the legal, how come that 
Mm. Nevertheless, all law is political. Maybe it's just a question of, um, yeah, of order here that that I'm that I'm unclear about. But more importantly, in any case, and Dysonhaus is following here Heller's criticism of Schmidt. If sovereignty is, is identified with emergency powers, as it seems to be here by Schmidt, it is unclear what remains of the Constitution apart from Article 48. Mm -hmm. And if nothing else remains of the Constitution, the very idea of, the, of an emergency collapses, since emergency powers surely are powers with an aim, namely the restoration of ex ante legality. Okay, so this was um, the bit about Schmidt. Now, briefly about Kelsen and uh, Heller. Kelsen's view can be described as a sort of legal positivism combined with li liberal agnosticism. The basic presupposition of Kelsen's understanding of, um, of the relation between law and politics is that they are, in fact, sharply to be distinguished. We have, on the one hand, legal science, which is the domain of description and evidence. And we have, on the other hand, the ethical political domain, pol ethical political ideologies, which is the domain of values and decisions and not of science. So he's making here a very sharp fact value distinction. The second basic presupp presupposition we need to be aware of is that the legitimacy of legality of every legal norm according to Kelsen, is derived from a so-called basic norm, a Grund norm, which is simply assumed. It, it's a hypothetical that doesn't even enter a constitution. It's uh, um, supposed to be something like uh, the constitution shall be obeyed, ought, ought to be obeyed. Something like that is the Grund norm. And it's only from this Grund norm that um, all statutes derive their, their um, normativity. Okay, and that can be described as, of course, as positivism. Now, with respect to Kelsen's verdict on the Prussia against Reich case, two points. First point, the judicial review, according to uh, Kelsen, was merely the most logical way of ensuring that a government stays within law. Sorry, three points. Second point, the constitutional court had entire jurisdiction in, the, in this case because of Article 19. Uh, Article 19 is, I mentioned Article 19 before, so you are aware of it. It was the article which was ascribing to the Constitutional Court quite serious powers because it was forcing the president to execute whatever the court decides. Okay, and that's on page, page one of the handout. And then finally, point three, Kelsen argued that the Constitutional Court was contradictory about Prussia's claims. For example, Article 48, uh, Paragraph 1, the emergency one, allows the Reich to make use of armed forces to compel Prussia to fulfill its duties. But surely, how could this be done given that Prussia's government had been uh, had been removed, had been dismissed. So how could then the Reich compel a non-existing government to fulfill its duties? So Kelsen was pointing out all sorts of contradictions like this in the, in the court's verdict. So Schmidt seems to be then partially refuted by Kelsen here because he's, for instance, uh, Kelsen is, for instance, rejecting Schmidt's rejection of the court's jurisdiction. The court, the constitutional court has jurisdiction in, in this particular case. So it, seem, it would seem to follow from this that uh, we can be happy as liberals. Uh, Kelsen will now reject the emergency decree. That's at least uh, the dramatic way in which Tysonhaus presents the case. So does Kelsen think that the emergency decree was invalid and that the court should have declared it to be so? No. From the standpoint of legal science, which is Kelsen's standpoint writing as a legal theorist and not as a judge, whatever the court decided, as long as it was constitutional and clear, was valid or is valid. That's what his positivism commits him to. One can only say the following, according to Kelsen, the president's decree is valid until nullified. 
So it's valid, it could be nullified, but it's not. In other words, it's nullifiable. It's voidable, but it's not invalid. And it's true that Article 19, Paragraph 2 states, quote, the president will execute the judgment of the court, unquote. And it's also true that the court could have invalidated the entire emergency degree. But since, according to Kelsen, it is not clear whether the court has invalidated the emergency decree and even which bits of it it has so invalidated, it is not clear what the president is, is to execute even according to Article 19. And so, Kelsen concludes, the emergency decree remains valid with unrestricted powers granted to the president and to his rice commissar who is to blame, according to Kelsen, not the court, not even the president, but the technical flaws of the Constitution, not offering any specification to the court how to exercise control over Article 48, the emergency powers um, article. Dyson, I will also now mention just briefly Dyson's, Dysonhouse criticism of Kelsen on this point. Dysonhaus argues that Kelsen has no conceptual means to defend the Constitution. Kelsen thought that the right judgment should have been the invalidation of degree. That was his own personal opinion. Uh, so the court should have up uphold um, the democratic and federal structure of the Constitution. However, because of Kelsen's positivism and political agnosticism, Kelsen could not resolve the, con the contradiction namely the con contradiction that the constitutional court both shares in legislative power, the court shares in legislative power, and on the other hand is supposed to be independent of legislative power. This seems to be a serious philosophical question. And therefore, Dysonhaus verdict is, I quote now, Kelsen seems at times to be developing a theory of constitutionality that would show how the formal aspects of a legal order impose genuine constraints on political power. This theory appears to be organized around the principle of legality, which gives substance to the idea of the Rechtsstaat. It is in terms of such a theory that he criticizes both Schmidt and the judgment. As soon as Kelsen comes to the point of saying what such constraints would amount to, however, he either seems to retract entirely or to say that the debate about such constraints is a matter of politics and not of legal science, unquote. And finally, Heller's point of view, which can be described as social republicanism, not socialism, but social republicanism. So he's obviously Dysonhaus's hero. Heller argues for a primacy of the political over the legal, so law is dependent on, on uh, political values. Neither should be law moralized, which is what Schmidt did, according to Heller, nor should law be amoral, which is what Kelsen did, according to Heller. We need first to have a non-neutral theory formulating fundamental political and ethical values. And this will then be expressed by, by fundamental or encoded in fundamental principles of law distinct from positive law. Distinct but informing positive law. And such values are not to be based on natural law. Rather, one might think they should be based on natural law, that's the only alternative, but no, that's not Heller's position. He rather thinks that these basic values are already embedded in our ethical practices and in our history, and in fact they are not rigid, but they are constantly developing. So there seems to be some sort of Hegelian background um, assumption here in Heller. All genuine legitimacy is based on popular so sovereignty and on nothing else. The Constitution is the juridic expression of the volonté générale, to which the government must answer. All citizens are granted basic rights, but this is not sufficient because economic equalities will produce political inequalities. The so-called losers of a society, the economic losers of a society, won't then see themselves as full participants in the political order, and therefore the political order will not have legitimacy for them. Therefore, Heller argues liberty and equality are two 
equally important substantive political values on which we have to base our um, entire social and uh, legal framework. The ideal here seems to be to approximate as much as possible total political participation of every individual citizen, and that's what then leads to his verdict on the verdict of the Constitutional Court in Leipzig, or in general on constitutional courts, while well, those are occupied by unelected legal experts, he doesn't entirely dismiss the, its, uh, its role, but it's to be minimized, for, um, um, for what we really need is full participation of every individual citizen and not re really the expertise of unelected uh, individuals. However, in the case of Prussia against the Reich, the Constitutional Court did have a duty which it failed, namely the duty to reject Hindenburg's degree because it exceeded Article 48 and undermined popular sovereignty. This duty, however, was not a particularly explicit duty of the judges as judges, rather of the judges as Weimar officials and citizens to defend people's sovereignty. And uh, just to end on this note, of course, we can then contrast this understanding of the role of a court with the famous verdict, uh, Marbury against Madison from 1803 by the US Supreme Court, which stated that it is emphatically the province and duty of the judicial department to say what the law is. Okay, thanks. <laughs>